All right, episode two here for our summer series. We're going to do linebackers and corners and safeties. We'll round out the defense today if you missed it. We did the defensive line in the first uh, episode. We have lumped everything else together because if you haven't been paying attention, we'll yell it at you here again on today's episode. Everything but boundary corners sort of are interchangeable for this group. Obviously, there's going to be a free safety. There's going to be a strong safety, and they're going to spend most of their time there. But other than that, going to be a lot of mixing and moving of parts. Uh, George Letzke, you brought with you the PFF grades. So sure. we'll kind of just start here with the corners. Sure. And and we'll go straight to um, the draft pick. The number one draft pick this year, Emmanuel Forbes out of Mississippi State. Uh, let's take a look here. I have his information up here. Six foot, of course, all the information, all, all, everything leading you know, after the draft was his size. Uh, they've got him listed as 180. I have heard he's put on a little bit of weight. Uh, we've seen the pictures, though. He is as skinny as advertised. Let's put it that way. His 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 calves look like my forearms. Um, <laughs> but but a rangy guy. That's kind of a, a, a word everybody uses, but but it is. He's got super long arms. He's what they're looking for now, uh, always around the ball. And I think <clears> the <throat> find is that those takeaways, while sometimes takeaways can be fluky, right? But I, I think just being around the ball that much of the time, in my mind, alleviates some of all that flukiness. George, what are the numbers say from PFF? Yeah, so to break it down, I have like variable scores. So you can always kind of chime in with me with, throughout the show, Doug. I have P, I have overall PFF score. I have coverage and run defense. I also have um, alignments and their snap counts. So there's, throughout the show, you can ask me any of those questions, and I got it for us. In regards to overall PFF score, we had Kendall Fuller with a 76, 76.6, Benjamin St. Juice with a 58.3, Danny Johnson with an 81, Christian Holmes with a 47.1. And obviously with um, Emmanuel Ford being a rookie, he doesn't have any PFF scores right now. So those are the cornerbacks. I'm going to safety whenever you're ready. <clears throat> okay. Uh, grab me one more. Tariq Castro Fields, if you have it. Give me a I moment. Don't know how much he played last year. Let, let's start going through them individually, Adam. What was your thoughts uh, when you looked at the tape and kind of went back after the draft pick and took a look at, at Forbes? What are your initial thoughts? I just think, you know, you also have to go by what, you know, some of his offensive teammates, particular, you know, Jahan Dotson, who's been very vocal uh, this camp about his opinions of, you know, his quarterback and, you know, in particular Forbes. And, you know, the consensus is that, you know, he's looking like a veteran out there. You know, he's not really making a lot of the mistakes you see from rookies and everything. Again, we'll see a lot more in training camp, but it sounds like, you know, he's really um, adapted to this playbook. Um, you know, he's aggressive. And I think everyone – <clears throat> you're going to have to wait till the season because, you know, the main question is, is his physicality. But again, if you just look at the, the tape in the SEC, you know, he was plenty physical, you know, there wasn't times where you're seeing him getting bowled over and, you know, granted uh, Mississippi state didn't put him in position to, you know, really get abused. So he'll definitely have some lumps early on, but I think that, his style is really fitting what Del Rio wants to do, which is a lot of pressure up front. And, you know, you talk about tip balls, you know, Forbes is opportunistic, if not anything. So I think that that's what we're going to see early on. And, you know, we've seen, a, a, I think last I checked was three or four interceptions and, you know, various uh, seven on sevens, 11 on 11. So I think he's got a nose for the ball. It's with I, fans will not like to hear this because they don't like their favorite team's players compared to the enemy. But I have heard several times that like Diggs is sort of the comp where he yeah. is always around the ball, but because he is willing to go for it, he obviously will get burnt. I mean, I think that's something that as fans, we have to realize corners get burnt. That That's, that's right. what they do. And, and that's why, you know, from guys we've talked to, you know, you have to have zero memory to play that position. It's why it's so hard to find guys that can just live out there on those islands and and put it out there for the world to see. You know, because I think that's the that's the big thing is that you got to he, he's going to go for him. He's going to get some. But I think he's going to get burnt to a lot like Diggs will. Uh, George, I think we can if we agree on on Forbes starting on the outside on one side. I, I think the biggest 
maybe conversation, let's call it, going into actual camp is who plays opposite. Re uh, read out those Kendall Fuller numbers again, because I think people will be surprised. He was very good once he got moved outside last year. 100%. Yeah, so Kendall Fuller, he actually had a 76.6 PFF score, 15th overall out of 119 cornerbacks. Uh, he had a coverage rate of 75.6 and a run defense of 73.7. So uh, Kendall Fuller, man, I think um, if you're asking me the question, who's going to start on the boundary, I do think it is going to be um, Emmanuel Forbes and Kendall Fuller charting out week one as the starters. Uh, Kendall Fuller, he's 28. He's one of the most experienced people in the defensive backfield. He had 1,030 snaps. He had more snaps than anybody else on the defense last year at the cornerback position. And I think that um, – I think Jack Del Rio trusts him. Ron Rivera trusts him. And I think he actually fits for what they want to do. Um, Benjamin St. Juice, they did invest in him as a third round pick. He has that big size, but I do think he's more of like a man cover, more of a physical cornerback. And I think we're going to start transitioning more to more zone coverage, even more so than last year. And last year I looked at PFF rates as well. Um, you know, I don't have the full numbers. It got up to like week 15, but around 70% of Washington's coverage was in zone last year. So if you have someone that's kind of reading off the ball and likes to jump coverage like Emmanuel Forbes, that's kind of Fuller's strength as well. That, that is not Benjamin Sanchez's strength. Right. So I think Fuller and um, and Forbes will be the first two trotting out there. But I think the one benefit is you do have four, you know you do have Benjamin Sanchez in that back pocket. You have him on the bench, and he can play the position, and hopefully he grows a little bit further. But to answer that question, I think it's going to be Fuller and um, Forbes to start off, and it's a great problem to have to have some good depth like that. I like that. <clears throat> it is a great problem to have, and it's one that I don't think we've had around here <laughs> yeah, for uh, sure. in a while in, in yeah. any of the secondary positions, really. I think, Adam, if you can help explain a little bit to, to the viewers – we, we talk a lot about on the show, and, and actually credit to you, Adam, because I really had always just figured it'd be St. Juice outside, and you kind of were the one a couple of weeks ago that maybe made me think more and more about Fuller starting outside. When we talk about guys that need a boundary to help them, where where the you know the slot you have both open sides, some some corners do better when they have that boundary line as an extra defender. Do do me for, explain that a little bit to our to our viewers and listeners what what that kind of means and why it helps some guys more well, than others. I, I think with, with the zone thing, it's it's all it's about coverage help in the back end, you know, because you have a lot of rotating, a lot of moving parts, so that can help. Uh, with St. Juice, um, I don't think he is as dependent as a lot of people think he is because exactly he's very physical. He's very good, you know, when he's manning up. I look at him as a very situational kind of player, like just say stick him on the outside. He's he's there to stay. No, I think that's going to be the advantage they have with Forbes because, you know, with Forbes and St. Juice, I think, you know, be matchup dependent. They'll be able to move him around. But really, to me, uh, what it comes down to is backside help, you know. So, you know, depending on the zone, the scheme, the cloud that they're playing, you know, it's really about the assistance that they're going to get, you know, in the back end. And we talked about for Forbes. Yeah, he'll get burnt from time to time, hopefully not too often. But that also has to do a lot with the safeties because there's a lot of, like we said, a lot of changes going in the back. You know, we talk about Forrest and Curl, you know, jumping in that, you know, that deep space. But, you know, we've heard a lot about Percy Butler really looking good in that role either. Also, and Martin, they're, you know, drafting him to do that as well. So I think you're going to have a lot of help for the corners this year. So I don't think you're going to see a lot of guys put out on the islands, you know, that we've seen in the past. I mentioned Tariq Castro Fields earlier. Um, George, will you bring the numbers up for him? Yeah. Uh, I brought him up because you and I were talking, George, on your to podcast. San Forte, to San Forte, right. actually, yeah. He, he yeah we him asked up. him who was the mm -hmm. guy nobody's talking about, you know, kind of in the fan world. Mm -hmm. uh, the guys around camp maybe got a better look at. And that was one of the guys he brought up. The, the team is high on him and his upside. Yeah, for sure. So he has a very limited data point, actually. He only had six snaps last year. He played five okay. in run defense and one in coverage. He had an overall grade of 63.1. Um, run defense 60.4 and covered 60.2. But honestly, for me, throw that number out. You know, there's only five plays. You can't really have a total evaluation yeah. off of that, in my opinion. But 24 uh, years old. This is only his second year in the league. Mm -hmm. uh, 6'1", 197. Adam, do you have anything more to add in on Tariq Castro Fields? Are you 
familiar oh, with them. I watched some college film them, you know, good stuff there. But again, like you said, that there's just not enough, you know, tape on the pros, you know, putting them out in boundaries or moving them around to see how he can really do so. Training camp, it, this is going to be a really interesting matchup, even though, you know, how interesting is the back end of the cornerback matchups? But, you know, I have them uh, probably going the season uh, with five. Uh, some people mm. had them six, but I, I think that, you know, Castro Fields, Holmes, and Johnson will probably be out battling out for two slots. But I agree. I keep coming back to you don't see Del Rio get rid of his draft picks in the first three years. So unless Holmes really regresses, I think that, you know, Castro Fields, that's a guy that you could probably slip onto the practice squad. We've seen with Danny Johnson, you know, if someone else emerges, you know, you can cut him, bring him back. But, you know, I, I think that it'll be an uphill battle for for him to beat out, you know, one on one on Rivera's draft picks. Christian Holmes, Oklahoma State, got drafted two years ago. Six foot one, two oh five. That's a boundary guy, or he plays in the slot, Adam. Strictly boundary. Um, he is stiff, and but I have heard they they have like you know um, how he's some of his fundamentals have been refined. You know they they've liked some of the things they've seen. But again, we're talking about back end guys, so that you know that last one, probably that last spot, you know, in the defensive backfield, it's going to be dependent on you know who really shines in camp because um, Holmes right now. He's just a guy, but you know, like yeah, I said, a lot of teams, not too many teams. The fifth cornerback is, you know, something to talk about. Otherwise, he'd be somewhere else playing, you know, three yeah. or four. So. And one of those guys for us is Danny Johnson, who is one of these guys that, you know, you, you respect these guys, right? Because he just grinds, and every time you think Danny Johnson, where'd he go? Now he's right there on the team. Right. They can't cut him off. And part of what you were saying there, Adam, is like what these guys have to do at the back end of this corner. Uh, depth is play special teams. Special teams. And yeah. while Danny Johnson is really good in that nickel role, and I and I think that's where he's best at, and was was really pretty good when he got his opportunities there last year. It, he's a special team through and through, and and you need those guys, and that's fine. That's not a that's not a dig. I think people think that being in the fourth or fifth corner and playing special teams is, I mean, still got yeah. a spot on the fifty three, and you're and you're, you're an injury away from being productive. And to Danny Johnson's point, he actually has produced pretty well since when he gets on the field. So looking at this, yeah. you know, I was pretty impressed by him. He had 300 snaps last year. He started for four games. He had a PFF score of 81, you know, as a, as a reserve corner. And what I liked about him is he basically rotated different positions as well. He had 202 um, snaps as a slot corner, 44 out in the boundary. So he actually, um, oh, sorry, let me think. I have the backwards. He had 202 that were out wide and 44 in the slot. So he can, so he can I do multiple things. I was wrong things. there. I don't, I don't yeah. know why. I thought he was a was a, a nickel guy. Yes, yeah, so, I mean honestly, I do I do like the fact that like you, I respect those guys, people that grind, get on the tra- get on the practice squad when their when their numbers called to get on the field. So I don't mind Danny Johnson at all. He's a good yeah. back end of the corner kind of guy. It was mm-hmm. necessity. He is a small <laughs> yeah. slot guy. It was a necessity last year. Again, we talk about Benjamin St. Juice all we want, but the guy can't stay healthy. So you, that's, that's why true. you see guys like him getting more snaps. But he's he's inside for sure. I don't trust him outside. Yeah. And and the last guy who actually was did get a lot of action last year uh, is Rashad Wild Goose, mm-hmm. um, who who was productive when he got uh, his opportunities. What what were the numbers there? Five ten one nine uh, one ninety one out of Wisconsin, twenty three years old. What were the numbers, George? Give me a moment for Wild Goose. I don't have him right handy. I pull it up right now though. Yeah, <clears throat> but he but he's in that mix as we look through it, Adam. While George is getting the numbers. It's, it's basically, as I see it quickly, as I look here, you've got, I mean, it's interesting what happens with Troy Atkin. People will laugh about that, but he's been a special team standout. Again, you need those guys. But it's Troy Apke, Tariq Castro-Fields, Emmanuel Forbes, Kendall Fuller, Christian Holmes, Danny Johnson, St. Juice, and I guess and I guess Wild Goose. That Those are the guys that are going to be fighting out for those, to your point, Depending on how many safeties they keep, five or yeah. six corners, I guess. Right. So I got I got Wild Goose whenever you're ready. So That's Wild good. Goose, 179 snaps in the slot. He was three on the boundary corner. Um, he basically had a overall grade of 50.7, had a very little run defense of 40.5, and a coverage grade of 53.9. Um, on the on 20 targets, 11 receptions given up for Wild Goose. So. I, I don't know. It doesn't seem like it's too promising there. I mean, he's obviously a back end of the player, six round pick from Buffalo, but you know, we'll see how it turns out. <clears throat> he's probably at the bottom of I that agree. list with Castro Fields that we kind of talked about there. Okay, we'll transition from there to the linebackers. I brought this up earlier. I, I think it's important. We'll kind of 
work outside in the, the line. So many of people have complained about the linebacker depth. And while I agree that there is not much depth there on the team, I think last year they were in nickel. Correct me if I'm wrong, fellas, but it was like 80% of the time, 75% uh -huh. of the time. I, I think I saw they were in base 43, four snaps last year. Mm -hmm. Not per game. Yeah, like the entirety of the season, they were yeah. in, you know, 43. So, I mean, I would think that you're looking a lot more 515, 425, you know, that that kind of that kind of scenario than you are uh your base 43. You got Cody Barton. I thought this was interesting. I don't know if you guys saw this. I I retweeted it the other day. Maybe Michael Phillips had was weren't in one of his columns, but basically Cody Barton said. You know, I left money on the table come to Washington because I was told I'd have an opportunity to get the green, be green dotted, as he said. And I thought that was really interesting. It makes me feel like they obviously had given him, at least verbally, this notion that he was going to get snaps. And that's why he's here. I, I don't think they, they did. They gave Jamin Davis the green dot for a little while at the end last year. But he was not playing middle linebacker. He was still off. I remember thinking that they had moved him to middle, and somebody corrected me on Twitter. I went back and looked at the tape. Sure enough, he was. He did when they gave him the dot. They did not move him to middle. So I, I think it's interesting with Cody Barton. Adam, I know you've done a little work on him. Uh, tell us what you think about him while he's doing that, George. If you'll pull up the numbers for him, I got it. <clears throat> well, uh, go ahead with the numbers first, then, and then Adam yeah. will get your thoughts on him. Yes, so Cody Barton had a PFF score of 63.7. Um, he had a coverage of PFF score of 60 and a run defense of 64.4. Um, this is all in Seattle, obviously. He had 894 snaps um, in Seattle, and he had 91 tackles last year um, with a 6% miss rate, which is actually better than Cole Holcomb, so pretty interesting. <clears throat> obviously, Cody Barton being the replacement for Holcomb this year as, as he went on to the Steelers. Adam, I, we've talked a little bit about, about Barton uh, over the years or not over the years, but over the off season here, what uh, tell us again, for those that haven't weren't on the episode last time. Yeah. You know, last, I was just trying to pull up my, my article on him, but um, last year he really didn't see extended time with the starting unit. Um, I think it was to the last six games, but when he did get his opportunity, uh, he really shined. Um, you know, there wasn't, there was some instances where he did get blown up uh, when um, uh, in run support, really, you know, just getting engulfed by, you know, bigger offensive linemen. But, you know, I think when they talk about the green dot, I think what excites people is, you know, his ability to drop in coverage. Uh, you know, he's always going to be compared through this year, at least to, you know, Cole Holcomb. And I think one thing that you're getting in him, you don't get quite maybe the, the, as a ferocious hitter as Cole Holcomb is, um, but you're getting a guy that's, you know, better in coverage proven. Uh, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go that far because like I said, he's got, although he had a lot of snaps, a lot of those snaps weren't starting snaps until the last about five weeks of the season. But um, again, you know, I don't know if George put this out, if I'm repetitive, I apologize, but he had 68.6 passer rating while in coverage last year. So, you know, that's, that, that's something that Washington really hasn't had for a while in their linebackers. So I think the hope is that, you know, you'll be able to use him in, in situations like that. But again, uh, I'll come back to it. You know, I think that they'll be using a lot more defensive backs and I don't see a situation where Jamin gets kicked off the field and it's just Barton. I see a lot of situations where it's one linebacker. I think they like what they have in Davis as far as, you know, his pursuit angles. Barton, that's that's a lot of the questions that I have for him is his pursuit angles. You know, he looks good, you know, when he's dropping his hips, going back in coverage. But, you know, when he had to go lateral, you know, that there was concern there. I mean, you know, he didn't really get beaten up over the top. One touchdown given up last year, uh, but he had two interceptions and three pass breakups. So, again, just on the raw numbers alone, uh, there is something to be excited about. Like, if you look at that, Washington hasn't had that probably since London Fletcher, a guy that can really, you know, you can just trust back there. But he may be, you know, going for the green dot. But Washington's a little unusual. I, I think they we're going to see through the years that there's going to through the season that multiple players are going to be wearing that green dot, not him, because usually you know that entails a guy playing you know 60, 70 percent of the snaps. No way, 
I see Barton getting past, you know, 40 would be max, and that's a generous. So it'll be interesting to see how they utilize him, but it's all about matchups. And I think if you, you know, going against teams, you know, Philadelphia, I think that's a situation where you could see him get a lot more snaps as long as, you know, we're not seeing him miss any tackles because, you know, heavy run teams, you want to have a guy like that. He's got better size than Holcomb, again, better in coverage. So, you know, we'll, we'll see. When, when you say that he had a 68% passer rating while in coverage, uh, I'll play the dummy here. I'm assuming that's the quarterback rating while he was, grade, yes. while he was playing against them. Right. Uh, yeah. It was his coverage grade, yeah. But, again, a lot of that got inflated, like I said, through those last four or five weeks because he had a lot of time on the field. A lot of it was due to injury. A lot of it was due to Seattle just, you know, moving things around. But, you know, I've talked to Seattle. When, as soon as we signed him, I talked to, you know, Seattle fans. I know they're just diehards, and they, they weren't happy to see him go. You know, they didn't want to see him get paid a lot of money, but they really thought that they could get him back on the cheap. So, for what Washington got, you know, a lot of fans in Seattle thought, you know, they should have re-signed him. So, that's always a good sign. I love what uh, you nailed it. Like, I love what you said, Adam. I think um, I think Col- Cody Barton's projection is very similar to Cole Holcomb's, right? I feel like the team basically wanted to get a healthier Cole Holcomb is what, in my opinion, like, you know, like Col- Cody Barton's kind of on the upswing. He potentially could improve. Like, they liked Cole Holcomb. They potentially wanted to keep him as well. But the injuries were just taking his toll. He only played, what, I think seven games last year, four games last year for Cole Holcomb. He basically was in it for most of the season. So they like that Cody Barton upswing there. Um, I do think I love what you said about the Philadelphia Eagles. I do think that um, he may play heavy in some games, but he will be more of a substitute package linebacker. But I also believe that like um, his narrative is kind of being untold a little bit right now. I know there was a lot of talk about, hey, Khalid Hudson is getting all these reps in training camp and Khalid Hudson might be the starter over Barton. I don't honestly believe that to be the case. I think um, it's just an indoctrination period for Cody Barton. He's new to the team. He doesn't really know the playbook. He's trying to figure things out, how to work with people. And I think he's basically just kind of taking a step back in the watching approach right now. He's kind of seeing how he fits into the defense. Um, you know, I think Khalid Hudson's a little bit further ahead in regard to his knowledge of the defense. So they're kind of putting him out there to not slow down the rest of the team because the rest of the team is already incumbents. He's the, you know, the whole team is pretty much coming back on the defensive side of the ball, except for Cody Barton. He's a new addition. So I think Barton will get up to speed eventually. I'm not going to say he's a diehard take over the game type of linebacker, but I can kind of envision kind of a Cole Holcomb role for him in DC. And I'm excited. I mean, we'll see how he goes. You know, one, one stat that I just noticed in my article that I was saying was 6.7 yards per reception, which was a league low uh, during that time. And, and that, nice. that's a good stat to have because you're basically talking about, you know, he's not chasing guys from behind. Uh, he, every, he's keeping relatively everything in front of him. So that's what you want to see in a, in a middle linebacker. You know, um, this is not a guy that's really going to wreak havoc around the line. This is a guy that you can drop, you know, drop in that that ten yard range. Try to keep everything in front of him. Set your team up for, you know, uh, you know, a lot of third and fours, third and five. So I think that 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 is that was an interesting stat as well that came out for him. And I and I definitely think there's a world in which they are in a four two five. Yes, quite a bit. That still allows them to get one of their extra safeties on the field. It allows them to be a little bit bigger. Uh, with Barton than it would with some of their safeties. I think he's a little bit. Do you have the number? Do you have the height and weight on Cleeky Hudson, George? I, I, I right actually now. was getting ready to go there next. I'm glad you had brought him up because he is getting work. And while I agree, he's probably not the starter at the end of the day. I know many people, including myself, really high on him coming out of of college out of Michigan, uh, where he played that Viper money backer. It's the Buffalo nickel here. Uh, I thought it was interesting that they've got him over in in that middle spot now, probably to your point, George, which was, which was a good one, that a lot of times guys you see in the offseason are out there so that everybody else isn't getting bogged down by the new guy needing to figure it out. Especially during this time of the year, June and July, once August starts coming around, we're going to start seeing training camp battles and fighting for position time. I think we're trying to install the defense right now. They wanted to have the most knowledgeable people on the field. Um, Khalid Hudson is six foot two twenty, so he actually he's kind of smaller than I thought. I thought he might have been a little bit taller than that, but six foot two twenty. <clears throat> and and that makes sense as to why he was kind of in that hybrid role. That, yeah, yeah, that viper role that kind of is it looks more like a safety, uh, but probably not quite as fast as you'd like. I don't have like his 40 numbers up or anything or his, or his splits, but I, I, I have in my mind that he was not uh, all that quick. And then of course, behind him, it, it's funny because 
if you look at the actual, I've got the list here. It's Cody Barton, Jamin Davis, My, Milo Eifler, Dejon Harris, Kaliki Hudson, and David Mayo. I mean, that's, that's the list, right? So, I mean, <laughs> outside of Hudson, Barton, and Davis, I mean, there's not a ton to write home about. And at the point being, and brought it up at the top of the show, and I will continue trying my best to pound the message home, that, that's by design. You know, they, they could have gone out and had a full 43-type middle linebacker and, and outside linebackers and set the whole thing up. It's just not what they do. So having a lot isn't necessary. Now, I will say, Adam, they've got zero room for injury error. Yeah. Like, yeah. the guys they got behind them don't excite anybody, I can't imagine. And then, you know, and I'll, and I'll throw in a wild card. Um, Andre Jones Jr., who was drafted in the seventh round, you know, he was projected coming out as a 3-4 outside linebacker, you know, 6'5", 258. He played a lot of linebacker in high school and college, you know, six years at Louisiana State. Um, I heard that, you know, they really – they would like to get him on that final 53 if he can progress, um, you know, have him a situational pass rusher, you know, an outside linebacker. You know, again, you're, you're, you're still talking about, you know, 15 percent of the snaps you know, something like that. But that's also a guy to look at, even though he's listed as defensive end on the, the breakdown on their website. I talked to Doc Walker, talked to so many people. I'm like, so is he just a straight defensive end? They said, no, they, they like him a lot in that hybrid outside linebacker role. And they don't have anyone like that. So that'll, that'll be interesting to watch. I don't know if he's going to be able to crack the 53, you know, with who they have as the other pass rushers. So it would have, someone would have to give. Um, but yeah, that's another name to watch. It would allow them to sneak him on as a linebacker instead of a D line. Whereas we talked about in the, in the previous episode, they, they, they're pretty, I mean, they're pretty stacked. You know, it's going to be hard to get on as a D end uh, right. with this group. It's interesting. I We had brought this up in the group chat, right, George, uh, about Adam saying that he had heard this. It uh, surprised a lot of people. I love that, it. I got that, that. that was the word. I love it. I mean, that's definitely what it's all about, right? Adam got his insight. He's sharing his opinion. I'm really keeping an eye on it. I hope I really do hope Andre Johnson um, shines and you know, provides an outside linebacker role. Um, one thing I want to touch on is – um, I'm just really happy with um, – I know it's, it's not funny. It might be blasphemous, but Jack Del Rio, like he gets a lot of like critiques and you know, he's a, people say he's a dinosaur and he has a very closed-minded vision on a defense. But what we're hearing is how dynamic and how flexible the defense actually is, which I think is pretty impressive. Like we keep talking about Jamin Davis in the linebacker role. I think Cam Curl is going to be playing more in the box. I think we, we have a lot of flexibility that we can basically – move some things around um, doing some research for this show. I do think um, Cam Curl would be more of like a dime backer with Jamin Davis potentially. Yep. Um, I think, I think he'll be the primary guy covering tight ends. I think he has a flexibility to do that, which also, you know, provides more flexibility for our nickelback and our other corners. I think, um, you know, Quan Martin, like I think he's going to be in an exceptional piece once he gets up to speed. Um, people definitely, you know, people dr like, drag Bobby McCain and I can see where they're coming from in regard to like mishaps and coverage, but he was a flexible piece. So you could play corner. Um, they could basically, he could flex all the way out to free safety, be a single high at any given point. And I can see, um, Quan Martin also doing that, but with a more, a, a more of an athletic profile, he's faster, can jump higher, he's stronger. And I think with, he has a higher ceiling than Bobby McCain ever did. Um, one of the things that I loved about, it, and I was doing some like film research on this, is the fact that they hide coverages where they might have like a too high coverage. Will be like Forrest and Cam Curl. Cam Curl will ro rotate down for a tight end, and then Bobby McCain would shoot up and become the free safety, provide a like, cover to like cloud coverage in the backfield. And I could see Quan Martin doing that as well. So there's a lot of flexibility, a lot of hidden like elements to the defense. I think is going to be coming with this year. I'm really excited about the flexibility and. You know, we touched on Percy o. Butler. I love him too. I yeah. think he has some potential. He plays, you know, he plays with like you know fire in his pants. I Man, he's he's a, a high energy player. So I'm excited about that too. So be good. I am too. You make a great point, George, and I think we, it doesn't get talked about enough. When when the two of them, Ron and Del Rio, got here, mm -hmm. I, I certainly was part of the crowd that said these dinosaurs. You know, the the league, the game has passed them by. They've been left behind. And to their credit, they've been kind of at the forefront, actually, of this movement to a 4-2-5. They were really early on this idea. I mean, you know, they were trying um, to get that Buffalo uh, nickel sorted out when it was Landon Collins, right? Yeah, that's uh, true. And what, I, and what I hope 
will happen is that they'll is that with the pieces that they have now with the with the forests and the butlers and even Reeves when I talked to Reeves he's kind of been assured he'll get more on the field playing time this year which I think is nice because he's another one of those guys right where like the Danny Johnsons of the world you get him on the field and he just knows where to be yeah and and him and and curl just seem to have but but I, I guess long way to get to i hope that they're able to use that to get curled down in the box more mm-hmm. and we talk about this buffalo nickel and who's going to play whether it be Quan martin you know go back to mccain when they finally had the pieces so they could get mccain out of free safety and down into the nickel to your point george allowed them to do so many more things because yeah. that really wasn't you know when people were excited about mccain in miami it wasn't because he was a stellar free safety no, it was because he was, he was in the slot. Position doing all those flex. Things that, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that could get back into free safety when yeah. needed. And I think that's one of the nice things about having Curl, Forrest, and I think Butler to start early. I, I had long thought it had been Martin. He's a second-round pick. And, and I think Martin will get plenty of work this year. But the other thing that needs to be credited to the coaching staff is – is they've been very loyal to kind of the pecking order. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you were here first, work your butt off. It's your turn. And I think they'll do that for Percy Butler this year. I think he'll get first crack at whatever it is they're going to call it. Because I I think when Percy Butler's on the field, you, you tell me if I'm wrong, Adam, but he'll be back into one of the safety spots and then they'll roll curl down in. Right. Yeah. They call it. It's like a cool. Package. The, the the Giants did it too over the last couple of years that they, they were doing it too. But yeah, that's more of the Cobra that 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 three headed look right there. And I agree with hundred percent. It's not just that he you know he he's paid his dues. I hear they are really excited with how much he's progressed. And I think that you know they even thought when they got him they got a steal because it, you know just coverage alone that's where he shines. The questions were him getting him close to the line. So the farther you can get him away, you know putting him in coverage the better but that's what's so good about force too that we saw what happened you know they're always better with curl in there but when he had to go in that strong safety spot and you know that they can you know use butler and you know even eventually martin and you know that interchangeable role i I think it'll be hard to keep a guy like butler off the field this year i think that they're going to find ways you know butler forest and curl i think you guys you're going to say i wrote an article you're going to see them somewhere you know 70 plus percent of the time because i think the point is getting your best guys on the field and i think that you know this right now in my opinion and safety is the deepest position that they have next to wide receiver. Got a question for you guys, if you don't mind, Doug. Yeah, um, no, so, you know, I, I love it. I, th- I love the flexibility of our safeties. I, I think Quan Martin's going to be an excellent piece. I think he's going to really change the whole dynamic of our defense. Well, let's say he kind of comes along slowly because we automatically assume he's going to be a week one starter, but you never know. Maybe he doesn't start till week three or four. Who's going to play that nickel position? In your, in your, uh, you know, from your perspective, and do you think Benjamin Sant Juice will potentially go back inside, or I, I feel like they wouldn't want to mess around with Forbes and Fuller on the outside. So I'm kind of curious if you think we'll play nickel. In your opinion, both of you guys, because Adam first, go ahead. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think if that happens, I think their plan is to have Martin in that slot. But if that happens, I think it makes more sense for St. Juice to slide inside instead of you know taking Fuller out from the outside. Forbes, I heard they're they're trying him everywhere. But I I don't see a scenario where they're going to have him in the slot too much. I think through the year, you'll see him here and there based on packages because that's just how Del Rio is running this defense. But if they have to have necessity, you know, St. Juice, yeah, we'll go inside. And that and that's simply that that's strictly if you're putting three corners out, Adam. Okay. That's that they're playing a three corner alignment. Yeah. Who do you so do you answer the question the same way if we're just talking about who gets into the nickel more often. Um, to, to nickel more often, I think that you know, it, it, as long as Martin's progressing, it's him because that you know they're drafting him high to be the come that guy, and also exactly he gives him the position flexibility to drop in safety. And where you can bring curl down in the box too. So I think he makes even more sense than Benjamin St. Juice. Benjamin St. Juice to me, um, having him fuller and Forbes. I think that only happens if things aren't going right. Cause if they, you know, if, if everything's going to plan, you know, you want to have Forbes and full on the outside and quantity, uh, uh, slot, and you're going to have, uh, uh, you're going to have curl forest and, um, 
Percy Butler as your, you know, interchangeable guys in the backfield. So ultimately that's, I know that's what they want to do, but if they have to, cause I, I know they, they like Benjamin St. Juice, but I also know that they double down at the position because they're not sold on his long-term future and that's same and, and fuller too, you know, again, he's not old, but I think that they're not banking on him past this year. Cause I think that, you know, he'd have to have a really good year to be around next year again. Cause he's got a pretty decently high salary for, you know, he his does. production. It does. It'll be interesting to see what happens after the ownership comes. When I had Stan to go on, he made a great point where, you know, this would be one of those opportunities to extend Fuller, actually give him two more years on the contract, get that number down. By the yeah. time the contract's over, he's 32 or 31. Um, but there's no money to be given out right now. So you're not <laughs> extending anybody. To me, this is the biggest conversation of the off season, how they do the back end, because, you know, you went right to Martin and I, while I totally agree with that, Adam, you know, we've also had the conversation of them getting um, the other three in with Butler. Right. So if, if, if they use, if they use Butler, Forrest and Curl, Curl Yep, as the five as the five is the is the three safeties in the five DB looks. Right. They I assume then that they roll Cam down into the big nickel. Percy goes to free safety and Forrest goes to strong. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. That that that's a look that I that I've seen, yeah. Because Butler's not really a strong safety. Not right? at all. He's not at all. Free safety. Pure, pure free safety. The thing about Martin Quan that's different though is you can just see his number from last year. Martin, if you had to do that, I feel confident that he could go to that strong safety role as well. You know, not huge, 5'11", 194, but but sixty four tackles, three tackles for a loss, and a sack, two forced fumbles last year. So he's shown his physicality. So I think that's a guy you can move around. But Percy Butler, to me, he is your true free safety. You know, you can have him in the. You can have him you know rotating in different uh packages but you you know you don't want him close to the line really you know and run support or you know anything like that uh, i don't i'm not sure how he's going to fare against the tight ends but you know we talked about curl out of anybody on this team any linebacker any db he is the best you know that they have a coverage tight ends and when they play teams with supreme tight ends that's what i expect to see i agree and then gentlemen the one last thing i want to add on is that's the beauty of all this right we have the flexibility to kind of do anything right we have the multiple safeties the multiple cornerbacks right in the nfc east we're going to face some big bodied wide receivers as well with aj brown and people like that i don't think benjamin st juice's story is untold yet i think he still has plenty of um plenty of life in him as well yeah. i could definitely see if things were like a trips left, you know, three wide receivers on one side, one big wide receiver on the right. We have Benjamin St. Juice covering that man on coverage yep. on the other side to kind of like have that physical presence, that man on coverage, because you can do multiple things. So yep. I think a defense is going to be multiple. I do think it's going to be flexible. It's going to be really fun to watch all year long. Yeah, Forbes mm -hmm. is going to, I think, you know, too, it's not going to be something like we're going to see Forbes playing, you know, 80, 90% of the snaps this year. I think it'll be closer to that 65% range and they're going to get St. Juice and whoever else. I don't think that he, maybe, you know, we start to get to the last five five, six games, maybe, but I think that they're going to ease him in like that. This is just something I've watched from Del Rio and, and Rivera through the years is, you know, they don't often just throw these guys out there like that, especially cornerbacks. So I think that he'll have a lot of support. I think that they're going to want to rotate a lot of guys as well, as much as possible. George, do you have the percentage of snaps for Kendall Fuller last year? Kendall uh, Fuller almost predominantly on the field. Like I, So um, I had right. the snap count. So Kendall Fuller, Kendall Fuller led the entire defense with 1,030 snaps last year. Uh, Deron Payne was 907 with number two. Derek That's Forrest, insane, by the way. Yeah, it's nuts. It's a lot more, he had a lot more than Jonathan Allen for sure. And then it was Derek Forrest, 849. And then finally, Jamin Davis rolling out the um, fourth spot with 833. So the recap, Fuller, Payne, Forrest, Davis was the um, snap counts, which is, you know, so that, that just shows me the trust in Fuller, in my opinion. Right. Mm -hmm. Also, that they're they're willing to keep you out there if you do. I was going to say because I didn't think that that they that those corners came off very much. I and and but they have enough. To your point, Adam, they could if they wanted to. Um, but it'll be interesting to see just what they think of if they see Forbes as that first round overall lockdown corner, and he probably plays a ton like Fuller did last year. I think it's the I think it's the the third if we're ranking position groups as we go through this and we I think all agree that defensive line 
is the best position group. Is it safe? Is it that? Is it the DBs next or receivers next? Where do the DBs fit into the position group rankings to you guys? I I think it's DBs number two. I think it's one A even. I think the DBs are very flexible. I like the depth that the cornerbacks have. I like the depth that the safeties have. Uh, They're all on rookie contracts except for Kendall Fuller as well. So they're young and they're growing together. So I think there's a lot of upside there. Um, The wide receivers are fantastic. You know that's that's a good problem to have as well. But you know obviously. Um, with the wide receivers, Terry McLaurin's that proven alpha dog. Jahan Dotson will have a nice, you know, I don't want to ruin it because we're going to talk about this in a week or two. Jahan Dotson is a strong um, candidate as well, another wide receiver one candidate. But, you know, Curtis Barnes more of a flexible piece, and Diamond Brown's more of an unknown. So I do think the um, defensive backs are more deep, and I like the flexibility that defensive backs offer. And I think our de- I talked to Adam, I think maybe offline, but our defense has the potential to be exceptional next year, you know, top 10, even higher than that, like could be really dominant if everything clicks. So I'm really excited. What, what did they end up last year? Were they, were they top 10 or just outside the top? So 10? they were third. I think they were third in yard. I can pull it up right now, but I think yeah. they were third in yards and seventh in points. Actually had a really good year last year. I'll pull it up right now. Yeah. Why you guys talk? Yeah. The, one of the things I, I will be interested to see when you pull up at those numbers, George is, it kind of last year's defense reminded me a little bit of the offense that the offense for all the yards they put up between the twenties mm-hmm. you know, just could not get it in the end zone. They could not right. score points. I think people will forget and we'll, when we switch to offense uh, in a week or two, we'll, we'll look at that. Um, but I think the, the number, the yard numbers weren't bad for the offense last year. I think similarly on defense, the turnover, which is why they went forward. The turnovers are down, right? turnover mm-hmm. machine. I think they were really good last year, but could not turn the ball over. Yeah. yeah so I actually have it right here. So they are um, third in yards, which is, you know, that's typically the ranking across the league. So the third NFL defense, they had seventh in points. And then in regards to interceptions, let me try to find that real quick, rank 28th in the league. So that's definitely yeah. a, uh, you know, that's a telltale sign of what they could be doing. And they were 29th the year before. So it's, it's, it's <laughs> 27th year before that. So it's that that's a major. And everyone talks about why Forbes over Gonzalez. There you go. There because it is. Gonzalez, he's he's a talented corner. I evaluate him too. Don't get me wrong. But I think Forbes has the best opportunity to transition with the talent around him to create turnovers, which that that's what I think that's that's the difference, you know, of playoffs in my opinion. And, with this and the toughness too, Adam. I think the I think the you talked you touched on Forbes and the tenaciousness that he has in run support. I think he's gonna give his full effort. He might not get the tackle every single time, but he'll throw a shoulder in there, which which I think Del Rio likes and appreciates. Uh, Rivera too. Especially for a guy that only weighs 180 pounds. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I see him go in there and put his helmet down. Yeah, uh, yeah. it's a big thing. But yeah, I definitely uh-huh. think uh, that that is a huge reason as to why the, the other reason and i was thinking about this with Quan martin you know i was a huge brian branch guy from alabama is kind of the guy he went one pick ahead of uh Quan there uh, and i re- remember talking to jim Nagy from the senior bowl about like how that went down and why washington wouldn't have you know what would it have cost to jump two spaces to be able to get brian branch if he's the better player and i remember Nagy says well i know from talking to the guys at washington they didn't think he was the better player like they really did think that Quan Martin, who was one of the biggest risers in the draft because of the because of the measurables, and what we've seen a lot here in Washington under Ron Rivera is they they are big on those Raz scores, and 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 they will much like Jamin Davis a couple of years ago, they will bet on your traits and their ability to get you there, and and, and that definitely is a Quan Martin pick type thing. And Doug, I don't know if you guys, either one of you guys, caught the commander's log with the behind the scenes in the war room for the um, commander's draft pick. Um, basically, someone approached Martin Mayhew and was like, "Hey, we're you know we're at pick sixteen. We have Gonzalez and Forbes on the books. Which one do you want to pick?" And he's like, "Forbes." He's like, "I've always thought that was a better player." He he openly said that he thought he was a better prospect. So Martin Martin Mayhew's high on him, so it's good. What well, was mm-hmm. crazy when you mentioned that? I also saw that same thing that they were looking at that Iowa pass rusher, Van Ness. I, yeah, Luca Van Ness. I'm, I'll be honest with you, I'm really excited how everything panned out because i'm not saying van ness wouldn't have been wouldn't have been a good player especially on this defense but man that would have that would have really i think shook a lot of people up because i think that those positions you know they're not quite the premium as cornerback and we talked about you know before the draft you know it was carlos rogers over 15 mm-hmm. years or whatever years ago it was so it was like i'm glad when, I, when Me too. Later on, i was glad that that didn't happen because i don't think that that a good scenario I agree. Yeah, I, I noticed the same thing, which was interesting because we talked a bunch on this show 
about the idea of maybe taking a D end in the first round mm-hmm. if the best one uh, was available. So yeah, I think that's great. So yeah, I think the you know the the defense is led. I, I think they've all along we've thought as the fan base and maybe even them as a coaching staff that the team was led by the defensive line. And while I and while I still believe the football is you know at its core a game of two lines pushing against each other. I think this defense and it's dare I say innovation is getting five and six defensive backs on the field as much as they can. They have invested a lot of resources into the position, whether it be draft capital or trade, you know, bringing back in a guy like Fuller. So I think as we're breaking these rosters down or this roster and the position groups throughout the summer, I think it's important to remember this is the bread and butter of the defense and and everything that they want to achieve this year, I personally think will rely on this group being at its best and, and flying around and turning the ball over. Got to get turnovers this year. Well, fellas, we will come back and see. We'll do offensive line next. Uh, and, I think, and I think that we're, we're looking at uh, maybe two weeks out for that one. Sounds so, good. George, you're going on vacation next yeah. week, I think. I'm going to Ocean City over the weekend. I'm going Saturday, coming back Tuesday night. So I can do I can record next Wednesday or something. Yeah, but going to Ocean City. Right. Well, have cool. a safe trip, man, and we'll uh, we'll see you guys next week. All right, have a good one, guys. Talk Thanks, you guys. Everybody. Take care.